Hello and welcome to another edition of Foreign Dispatches. I'm Amarachi Uvani. On the program this week, deadly Israeli strikes continue in northern Gaza as the army tightens its siege, plus in Lebanon. Thousands flee the conflict into Syria as the UN warns of a growing displacement crisis. Welcome to the program. Israeli forces have been carrying out intense strikes on northern Gaza, which Israel claims are targeting remaining Hamas positions. However, hundreds of people, including many civilians, have lost their lives in the attacks. The offensive has also reportedly led to the closure of medical points and shelters, along with the suspension of crucial humanitarian services, including malnutrition treatment. Displaced Palestinians woke up to their tents on fire in the early hours of Monday after an Israeli airstrike hit Al-Aqsa Hospital in central Gaza. Medics reported several people killed and dozens of others wounded. Several tents were also set ablaze following the Israeli attack as some Palestinians tried to put out the fire. Our money, belongings, mobile phones and everything we had are all gone. We have been displaced times and times again until we settled at the hospital here. As you can see now, everything here is gone. At 1 a.m. we woke up in shock to find the fire. I quickly ran with my daughters. Where shall we go? All the clothes and belongings are gone. There's no safety, whether at a hospital or school or any place. Israel's military said it stuck militants operating from a command center inside the compound. It accuses Hamas of using civilian facilities for military purposes, which Hamas denied. The strike came as Israeli forces widened their raid into northern Gaza. Residents said the military had isolated several areas in the far north of the enclave, including Jabalia, Gaza's largest historic refugee camp. We are aware of very disturbing reports about an Israeli attack on the grounds of a hospital complex in central Gaza. The Secretary General condemns the large number of civilian casualties in the intensifying Israeli campaign in northern Gaza, including its schools displacing sheltered Palestinian civilians. He strongly urges the parties to the conflict, all parties to the conflict, to comply with international humanitarian law and emphasizes that civilians must be respected and protected at all times. Humanitarian assistance into Gaza is woefully inadequate and is at the lower, lowest level in months. Israel has been ordering people to leave Jabalia and the far north as it pushes on with a new ground offensive, which it says is meant to root out Hamas fighters who are trying to regroup. Despite official denials, there are widespread fears that a systematic Israeli plan is being implemented to move what the UN estimates are some 400,000 people from the northern third of the Palestinian territory and declare it a closed military zone. Aid agencies say there are no safe areas left in the enclave. They are also worried about severe shortages of food, fuel and medical supplies in northern Gaza, saying there is a risk of famine there. The essential conditions for effective aid operations are severely lacking or entirely absent. Gaza has become the most dangerous place in which the UN and its partners operate with at least 300 colleagues killed. Warehouses have been bombed, roads are damaged or destroyed and littered with unexploded ordnance, and law and order continues to endanger staff, aid and operations. Since the 7th of October, Healthcare in the Gaza Strip has faced severe destruction, obstruction, militarization, and or criminalization. The health system has suffered immensely from repeated attacks, as well as ongoing shortages of key supplies, medicines, fuel, and its workforce. 
Since October 2023, there have been at least 516 attacks recorded on healthcare in Gaza, resulting in immediate death, injury, and or detainment of both patients and providers. Since early January, more than 20,000 children have been admitted into malnutrition treatment, of which 4,000 of them are seeking severe acute malnutrition support. Over 96% of women and children between the ages of 6 and 23 months are not meeting their nutritional needs, and this will have a lifelong impact on their cognitive abilities. The northern part of Gaza, home to well over half the territory's 2.3 million people, was bombed to rubble in the first phase of Israel's assault on the territory a year ago, after the October the 7th attacks on Israeli towns by militants who killed 1,200 people and captured 250 hostages. Israel's military campaign in Gaza, aimed at eliminating the militant group Hamas, has killed more than 42,000 Palestinians since it began a year ago, according to Gaza's health ministry, and has laid waste to the enclave. Meanwhile, the ongoing conflict between Israel and the Iran-backed Lebanese group Hezbollah is tearing families apart, forcing many to flee Lebanon in search of safety and a better future. Thousands have fled to war-torn Syria to escape air raids, while schools, clubs and parks have become temporary shelters for the displaced seeking refuge. At the Masna border crossing between Lebanon and Syria, Amal Ismain's 18-year-old son is leaving to seek a future she says Lebanon can no longer offer. It's a painful farewell for the family. This country has no future currently, not for the youths. These families are all also living for Syria. The crater they have to cross, caused by an Israeli strike on October 4, is a stark reminder of the dangers they now face in Lebanon. This father of five says his family decided to leave after surviving some near misses. According to the United Nations Humanitarian Response Agency, more Lebanese have now been displaced than during the last major war between Israel and Hezbollah in 2006. Around one million people fled their homes back then. I mean, this was just the beginning. What we are listening in Lebanon is a, a massive uh, operation with strikes, uh, uh, heavy bombardments, obviously also with bombardments from the Hezbollah side, but uh, that are causing a dramatic number of civilians being killed. We believe that uh, um, the number of killed uh, is close to 2,000, and uh, we see already 170,000 people fleeing to Syria. We see more than 1 million displaced. We see an enormous tragedy in Lebanon, and we must do everything to avoid an all-out war in Lebanon. For newly displaced families in the country, officials say the situation is critical as shelters fill up. Israel, which began incursions into South Lebanon two weeks ago to battle Iran-backed militant group Hezbollah, has issued military evacuation orders affecting more than a quarter of the country. In a country of that size, which is relatively small, and a population that's estimated around 5 million people, you can imagine how dramatic it is that over 1 million people are now without shelter and on the move, or not rather without shelter because they are being housed in, in collective centers, but are being forced to flee their homes in search of safety. And 
Israeli airstrikes and Israeli evacuation orders continue to increase the areas impacted. So now that we have over 25% of the country under a direct Israeli military evacuation order, just yesterday we had another 20 villages issued with an evacuation order in the south of the country. Last few days in particular, which is, I mean, how Aid I agencies warned the displacement crisis in the region could get worse, with Palestinian and Syrian refugees being displaced repeatedly. Yeah, so far, Palestinian refugee community here in Lebanon have been uh, affected the same way the broader uh, Lebanese population has been uh, impacted. Uh, uh, and one basically uh, here in the country, Lebanon is a country where you have also a large number of uh, Syrian refugees. So basically anyone has been impacted. Uh, and what we have seen until now, it's a large scale displacement of people, primarily coming from the south, uh, going to Beirut or going further north. Uh, so there is no exception when it comes to the Palestinian refugees. We have a number of camp uh, in the south. Uh, most of the people have left uh, the camp and are seeking a shelter elsewhere, either around Beirut, but primarily also in our camps in the north of the country. The displacement is part of the uh, history and the tragedy of uh, the Palestinian. Uh, the Palestinian refugees uh, here in Lebanon have been displaced. We have also Palestinian refugees from Syria who have been displaced a second time and came here in Lebanon, and those who have gone in the camps uh, in the south uh, are now displaced for the first time. Now, uh, that's part, unfortunately, of, uh, of their plight. Uh, but if you compare with what happened also in Gaza recently, you might have heard me describing how people are constantly being moved like uh, pinballs. Uh, and uh, one of the fear is that uh, we replicate uh, a situation similar to the one we have seen until now in Gaza. The main focus of Israel's military operations has been in the east, the suburbs of Beirut and the south, where there have been incidents involving UN peacekeepers amid calls by Israel to withdraw. The charge that Israel deliberately attacked uniformed personnel is completely false. It's exactly the opposite. Israel repeatedly asked UNIFIL to get out of harm's way. It repeatedly asked them to temporarily leave the combat zone, which is right next to Israel's border with Lebanon. In fact, on the day that Israel began its ground operation next to our border with Lebanon, we asked them specifically, please leave this area so you're not harmed. Israel is not fighting UNIFIL. It's not fighting the people of Lebanon. It is fighting Iran's proxy Hezbollah, which uses Lebanese territory to attack Israel. Hezbollah attacked Israel last year without any provocation, on October 8th, a day after the Hamas massacre. And it's continued to attack us ever since by launching over 10,000 rockets and missiles at Israel. Hezbollah uses uniform facilities and positions as cover while it attacks Israeli cities and communities. The UN interim force in Lebanon has said its peacekeepers in southern Lebanon would not move from any positions. As you know, the decision uh, was made uh, uh, that UNIFIL would uh, currently stay in all its position uh, uh, in spite of the uh, calls that were made uh, uh, by the Israeli Defense Forces to uh, vacate uh, the position that are in the vicinity of the Blue Line. I want to uh, emphasize that this decision uh, still uh, remain. It was confirmed this morning by the Secretary General. We had a, an executive committee meeting on that specific issue. And uh, I want also to emphasize that this was a decision that was very carefully considered based on a number of uh, elements and criteria. Of course, safety and security of the peacekeepers is a paramount priority. But uh, there are uh, a number of other elements, and one of them is the responsibility that we have and UNIFIL has uh, in regard to the mandate that was given to it by the uh, Security Council. As the situation in the Middle East worsens, world leaders continue to call for an immediate ceasefire. The Lebanese Health Ministry says 2,350 people have been killed since the conflicts between Israel and Hezbollah escalated last month. While Israel and Hezbollah have maintained an uneasy truce following the end of a full-blown war in 2006, 
the Lebanon-based group began launching rocket attacks on northern Israel last October in support of Gaza group Hamas. Thank you for staying with us. With the immediate threat of hurricanes Helene and Milton now passed, millions of homeowners and business owners across Florida and the southeastern United States face the daunting task of rebuilding their lives. Experts point to climate change, which has spurred marine heat waves globally, leading to more intense hurricanes, heavier rainfalls, and rising sea levels that increase storm surges. U.S. President Joe Biden on Sunday toured the affected parts of St. Petersburg, Florida, meeting with survivors and surveying the damage caused by Hurricane Milton. Milton, which is believed to have led to the death of at least 24 people, was the second powerful storm to batter the low-lying coastal state in two weeks. Hello, folks. Just met a number of the homeowners who wiped out and the and the Coast Guard, the fire department, it's a hell of a deal. I'm here in Florida for the second time in two weeks and uh, to survey the damage from another catastrophic storm, Hurricane Milton. Thankfully, the storm's impact was not as cataclysmic as we'd predicted, but on top of two before it, just keeps seeming to get getting worse. And, uh, by, you know, but for some individuals, it was cataclysmic. All those folks who not only lost their homes, but more importantly, those folks who lost their lives, lost family members, lost all their personal belongings. Entire neighborhoods were flooded. And millions, millions were without power. Hurricane Milton barreled into the Atlantic Ocean on Thursday after carving a destructive path across Florida, spawning tornadoes and leaving millions of people without power. Despite the widespread damage, the storm did not cause the catastrophic storm surge that had been feared. We heard it when it was first coming through, so we ended up going into the bathroom. As we was going into the bathroom to get cover and sit down on the floor and sit down, that's when the roof started pulling off. I started seeing outside of the house, all the windows busted out. It was devastating. To the point, everything from the attic went to flying around my house. The roof went to pulling off as, it, as the tornado was spinning on top of my, it felt like the tornado was spinning on top of my house. Tornado touched down on the other street and it came through here and devastated everything. I, I was watching the news and the news say a hurricane coming, so prepare for the hurricane. I try to get prepared for the hurricane, then the tornado hit. I'm like, the tornado hit before the hurricane, this is a double disaster. So, you know, I'm glad that me and my family made it out alive, you know, and we in good shape. This is the neighbor's house. I'm here helping the neighbor. I ain't even got my yard finished, you know, but I love my neighbors like that. Hi. As communities look to recover from the impact of the hurricane, they face the daunting task of sifting through the remnants of their homes while grappling with difficult decisions about their future. Everything's gone. Only thing standing is the main part of the restaurant, the first floor of the packing house, and the flagpole. The flag is flying at half mast in memory of everybody that's worked here for the and the destruction of everything that we've worked so hard for. We hope to get it up back up as fast as we can, Lord willing. We're, we're fasting, we're praying for God's assistance and direction in this tough time. And um, we don't really know what happened, but you can look around and see that it was pretty crazy what happened here. And we don't know what's next, but we're taking it one day. Of course, as most people know, uh, Hurricane Helene came through. Uh, that was the first hurricane that hit our home. Thankfully, our storm doors actually held, but unfortunately, we did get some water in, probably about four to six inches inside. But unfortunately, a lot of our neighbors ended up blowing out their um, back doors, and so their first floors were flooded. For, so a majority of the units here were, were experienced that. Uh, the second one, uh, Hurricane Milton, um, thankfully we had everything boarded up, so we didn't get too much damage, but we are missing our roof. And unfortunately, several of our neighbors are also missing their roofs as well.
The community of Point Pines faces the possibility of being torn down. Many of the homes here were built in the 1950s. What I understand are going around and marking all the houses inhabitable right now. So just trying to clean up. I was trying to clean up the street so we could get cars down the street without getting flat tires. And the inside of our house is pretty much trash. So, yeah, we on the back side, we had a wall blowout. And just kind of like everybody else, just come in day by day and start cleaning up. Are you planning to rebuild? Kind of depends on what they mark the house. If they say that it's less than 50% and we can rebuild, we will. Did you have insurance? Uh, no, no insurance. Uh, several of the homeowners in this area have no insurance. Between them, the two deadly storms have cost about 250 people their lives, thousands more their homes, and left millions of Florida residents and businesses without power, many of them possibly for weeks to come. It was the strongest winds we've ever had here in St. Petersburg in 103 years. We were hit with the north side of the winds, so we were bearing the biggest impact of the winds here. And because we've had three hurricanes, this was our third hurricane in a row. We had one in August, one in September, and this was the third one in October. And all with all the winds and the rains pushed on these trees, and this was the third hurricane, was too much for these see, trees. You can see the roots, yeah. they just tumble over. Yeah. The big tree fell down, the other one fell on our house. So no there's power, no power, no, no water. water. Um, because the roof, uh, there's a hole in, hole the, in the roof, roof. so there was some water damage on the floor. Uh, so we can't stay there. We yeah. don't know how long it's going to take for us to go back to normalcy. According to estimates, the combined private insured losses from the two hurricanes could reach $55 billion. And authorities say there will be no creek recovery. And finally, on a lighter note, we head to South Africa, where the Congress of Nigerian Students at the University of Johannesburg recently held its annual Niger Day Festival. Themed Leadership in Pursuit of Excellence, this year's event coincided with Nigeria's 64th Independence Celebrations. Our South Africa correspondent, Innocent Samosa, brings us the details. <laughs> The 2024 Niger Day Fiesta event coincides with the 64th anniversary of Nigeria's independence, making a milestone for both the students and their homeland. Adebayo Tachudin is the president of the Congress of Nigerian Students at the University of Johannesburg, also known as Konsuj. We know there are challenges back at home, but we believe in Nigeria's spirit and that there will be light at the end of his honor. In his keynote address, the president of the Nigerian Citizen Association in South Africa, Frank Onyekwelu, told students to be courageous. Whatever be your background, let it not be the reason why your back should remain on the ground. Wherever you are coming from, whatever you have seen so far, remember what is ahead of you. Whatever price you are paying today, is for the glory you will celebrate tomorrow. Friends of the Nigerian students at the University of Johannesburg, both from South Africa and Zimbabwe, had this to say. With this mindset, I'm able to take it to my community. And when someone says, oh, Nigerians do these bad things, I'm like, wait, not this Nigerian, not my profession. As Africans, our diversity in our strength, we must learn from each other and uplift each other as a continent. The event also honored individual achievements. But how does this celebration of Nigeria's 64th independence resonate with students at the University of Johannesburg? The president of NANSA, Abdul Zarek Abubaka, had this to say. We appeal to the leaders, uh, President Bola Mintinibu and uh, his cabinet, the ministers, that they should please continue to work in the interest of the Nigerians in Nigeria and also in South Africa. Like our national item says, our tongues and tribes are different, but one common thing that has held us as Nigerian students in South Africa is the unity. 
been that we are far away from home. This is just our way of, you know, showing our recognition and our allegiance to our home country that even though we are far away, we still remain Nigerians. That's why we are doing this to honor also our fathers and our mothers who have done so much for the country. Now, attendees told Channels Television that events like this are vitally important for cultural awareness and unity among students. And that's it on the program today. Remember, our top stories are never far away. You can catch them on channelstv.com. Thank you for watching. I'm Amarachi Ubani. Bye for now.